Good morning to all. What great spirit we have here. I was visiting with Kyle the Cantor, and he said it's wonderful to sing with a gathering of those who are singing with him. So thank you for your participation this morning. It was inspiring for him who was able to join us today and lead us. It's my privilege to introduce this morning our keynote speaker, Archbishop Joseph William Tobin, a native of Detroit, Michigan, and the eldest of 13 children. <laughs> Professing his first vows in the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, the Redemptorist, in 1972, he was ordained to the priesthood in 1978. In his early years as a priest, were spent ministering in parishes in the Archdiocese of Detroit and Chicago. The Archbishop holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the Holy Redeemer College, Waterford, Wisconsin, and a master's degree in religious education and divinity from Mount Alphonsus Major Seminary in New York. He speaks English, Spanish, French, Italian, and Portuguese. In 1991, Father Tobin was elected General Consultor of the Redemptorists and on September 9, 1997, was elected Superior General, a position he held for two consecutive terms. That same year, he became Vice President of the Union of Superior, Superior General. In his capacity, he served as a, number, as a member of the Council of Relations between the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life and the International Union of Superior General from 2001 to 2009. In addition, he was appointed by the Holy Father to participate in five synods of bishops. On, on August 2, 2012, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him Secretary of the Vatican's Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. Subsequently, he was ordained to the Episcopate on October 9, 2010. As former secretary, Archbishop assisted in overseeing approximately 1,900 priests and brothers and 750,000 religious sisters across the globe. Just recently, on October 18, the Holy Father announced Archbishop Tobin as the 16th Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. As Archbishop will oversee more than 2,500 2, Catholics and 151 parishes in 39 counties in central and southern Indiana. His massive installation is scheduled for December 3rd. With all that being said, we welcome Archbishop Hoban, a friend of NRBC, someone who is passionate about religious life, and the new Archbishop of my home diocese. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There's a simpler way to introduce myself, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I'd like to tell you what I'm feeling right now, and I can do it best with a story that uh, comes from the life of a favorite son of this state, Lyndon Johnson. When, uh, when Brother Paul asked, invited me to speak with you more than a year and a half ago, I readily said yes, because I admired this organization. However, standing before you, I feel a little bit differently. And I'm thinking of a story that comes, was written actually by Peter Benchley. You might remember Peter Benchley uh, wrote a fish story back in the, in the 1970s called Jaws. <laughs> well, before he re uh, claim, uh, received some fame as a novelist, Benchley was a writer in the Johnson's uh, White House. He wrote speeches for the president. He wasn't a very good writer. 
So the chief of staff demoted him to writing one speech a week. One that the, the president would give on Friday afternoons in the Rose Garden. It was properly known as the Rose Garden Rubbish. <laughs> it would be a series of nosegays that were cast before the future farmers of America, or the Boy Scouts, or whoever happened to show up in the Rose Garden on a Friday afternoon. Unfortunately, Benchley didn't do a very good job with the Rose Garden Rubbish. So the chief of staff called him in and he said, you're fired. Write one more speech, and then you're out of here. So with great sorrow, Benchley sat down on his typewriter, and he got some nice little cards, like the ones you find on your table. And he typed out notes for the president for the following Friday. And that morning, as the president was exiting through the Oval Office out into the Rose Garden, Benchley handed him the cards. Johnson put it in his suit pocket and went out to speak. And when he got out to the uh, podium, he put the cards down and put on his spectacles and he uh, looked at the first card and he said, uh, my fellow Americans, <laughs> today I'm going to explain to you how we're going to end poverty in the United States by the end of the month and cut taxes. <laughs> and he went to the second card and it said, I'm also going to explain to you how we're going to end the war in Vietnam by the end of the year and stop communism. <laughs> and with great trepidation, he went to the third card. <laughs> and it read, you're on your own, Lyndon. <laughs> so I accepted those index cards from Brother Paul more than a year ago. And the third one seems to make a lot of sense right now. <laughs> However, what uh, Father Anthony said at the beginning is very true. I do feel at home with you. I feel at home because I can introduce myself simply with the words of Genesis. I'm Joseph, your brother. I'm your brother as a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm your brother in the consecrated life. And I feel passionately about the vocation that we share. And there are at least three reasons why I'm happy to speak with you this morning. The first is that I'm pleased to be speaking to vocation directors. I'm aware that you're on the frontiers of re religious life today, a place where you are required to speak on the virtue and value of our vocation to an often skeptical and disillusioned office audience. Years ago, a Redemptorist Confer who was engaged in vocation ministry asked me how one might define an optimist. And he answered, a vocation director with a beeper. <laughs> I'm not here simply in an attempt to encourage you. Rather, I look forward to our conversation today and throughout this weekend, because I'm confident that you have much to say about the present state and future prospects of religious life in the United States today. And so I look forward to learning from you. Secondly, I'm grateful to participate in a convocation that is sponsored by the National Religious Vocations Conference. Over the last two years, a time when I served as part of a, the Dicastery of the Holy See that has the mission of accompanying religious life throughout the world, 1,300,000 women and men, I had many opportunities to review the work of the NRVC and to cooperate with its, its executive director, Brother Paul Bedarczyk. The research, formation strategies, and networking of this group are very impressive. In fact, I cannot think of an organization in the church that is making a similar contribution to vocation ministry among the institutes of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life. When Brother Paul invited me to speak, I quickly accepted, buoyed by gratitude for my own vocation, as well as the certainty of being useful to you in some way. As my paternal grandmother from County Kerry used to observe, Joseph, everyone is useful for something, even as a bad example. <laughs> Finally, I've looked forward to this convocation because its organizers have chosen a crucial and timely theme 
vocation ministers as ambassadors for Christ, a reconciling presence. The theme is crucial since reconciliation lies at the very heart of the gospel. It is timely because there are circumstances within the church and diffused throughout the contemporary society that threaten to blunt the full force of reconciliation, the principal effect of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. A reflection on reconciliation is particularly appropriate as the church commemorates the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Second Vatican Council and also begins to profit from the reflection of the just concluded Synod of Bishops, which was focused on new evangelization for the transmission of the Christian faith. On the one hand, it is clear that in his opening address to the bishops assembled in St. Peter's Square on October 11th, 1962, Pope John XXIII deliberately set a conciliatory tone and a conciliatory task for the Council. In fact, reconciliation is a key to understanding the subsequent doctrine of the Council in such areas as the Divine Liturgy, as well as the Catholic Church's relationship with other Christian churches, non-Christian religions, and the modern world itself. On the other hand, any attempt at a new evangelization will soon wither before the frigid force of polarization existing in the Church. Hence, it behooves Catholic Christians to hear afresh the call to be reconciled in order that our witness might be credible. Jesus prayed that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. The guiding theme of this convocation invites you to recognize that in your ministry as vocation directors, you serve not only as ambassadors for your own communities, but also for the Catholic Church, and in a sense, represent the vast spectrum of specific vocations which are commonly grouped under the rubric religious life. It is possible that amid the divisive forces that threaten to undermine a church of communion, vocation directors may serve as bridge builders, even as ambassadors for Christ who consciously work for healing within the household of God. How do I hope to use the time that has been allotted to me? First, I invite you to consider the gift of reconciliation in the rich theology of the Apostle Paul. Then we will examine some conditions in American society that make the appropriation of this gift more difficult, but nevertheless ever more urgent. We will then think about a few of the consequences of the gift of reconciliation and look what it might mean for vocation directors to be ambassadors. Finally, I might be able to offer some suggestions that flow from this consideration. The best part, of course, comes afterwards when we will have time for a conversation and a chance to learn from each other. The theme of this convocation suggests an obvious point of departure for our reflection the 20th verse of the fifth chapter of St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, which reads, So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if Christ were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The second letter to the Corinthians probably is the most subjective and most personal of all the epistles of the apostle to the nations. We know that it was written in Macedonia, most likely in the autumn of the year 57, during Paul's third and final great missionary journey. Paul's emotions remained very close to the surface as he wrote this letter. He is at once affectionate and easily hurt, yet happy when he can affirm his audience. However, he does not hesitate to challenge those who hear his word. In the just cited passage, Paul offers a practical exhortation that reads something like this. Reconciliation can be lost. Therefore, those who have accepted the gospel must always permit it to ex exercise its effect on them. What is this reconciliation that Paul is talking about? Throughout his writings, Paul uses a number of figures to describe the lasting effects 
of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, in which we all share through baptism and faith. These effects include the reconciliation of men and women with God, the expiation of sins, their redemptive liberation, and their justification. The main effect of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection is the reconciliation of human beings to God. That is, the restoration of women and men to a state of peace and union with God. This effect is called reconciliation and is expressed most often by a Greek word which derives from the verb which means to make peace after a period of war. In a religious sense, these words denote the return of human beings to God's favor and intimacy after a period of estrangement and rebellion through sin and transgression. The gift of reconciliation underlies much of Paul's gospel, but it is developed explicitly in the passage we've just cited from 2 Corinthians, as well as in Romans, Colossians, and Ephesians. By the favor of Christ Jesus, the sinner has access to the presence of God. He is introduced once again, as it were, into the royal court of God himself. Christ has become our peace, for he has broken down the dividing wall between Jews and Greeks and abolished the law's commandments. He has made one new man of the Jew and Greek and has reconciled them to God in one body, in just a moment, I'd like to return to that striking metaphor for reconciliation as the destruction of a sort of Berlin Wall. Through his cross, hostility has come to an end, and Christ has brought peace to the human race. In a number of letters, Paul will insist, since we are justified, we are at peace with God. Reconciliation is also a cosmic event embracing all things, whether on earth or in the heavens. In summary, by the free gift of reconciliation, we who were once enemies of God are reconciled to him through his son's death. Now reconciled, we shall be saved. Indeed, we boast of God and the close union we have with him through Christ. The English word atonement aptly expresses this Christian condition at one moment with God. The free gift of reconciliation with God gives us both the possibility and the motivation for becoming reconciled with one another, even when we have every reason to remain enemies. This consequence of reconciliation receives evocative expression in the letter to the Ephesians, where Paul speaks about the saving plan of God in Jesus Christ. The second chapter of that letter is filled with sharp contrast between human weakness and the consequence of the saving power of God. Jews as well as Gentiles were under the power of sin. The Gentiles were in fact dead, and the Jews cannot boast that they were superior. But God, I'm quoting here, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in, the kindness, in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Here Paul describes reconciliation with three verbs, brought together, raised together, and enthroned together. And each verb is pre prefixed by the preposition with, with Christ brought together, with Christ raised together, with Christ enthroned together. Thus, Paul brings out forcefully the intimate association of the Christian with Christ Jesus. Christ himself is the bond of unity the one who has finally succeeded in bringing Jew and Gentile together. Here Paul inserts the example of the, of the dividing wall of the Jerusalem temple as he reminds his Jewish and Gentile readers alike, for Christ is our peace. He who made, both one, who, who made us both one and broke down the dividing wall of enmity through his flesh. 
like the Berlin Wall or similar constructions along the border of the United States and Mexico, the dividing wall has both a physical and a psychological meaning. The famed Romano-Jewish historian of the first century, Titus Flavius Josephus, tells us that there, this wall was a stone partition, three cubits, or about four and a half feet high, that separated the outer court of the temple from the inner court. On this partition were signs prohibiting, under pain of death, any foreigner from going further. The stone wall was but a token of the whole system of separation that went into every phase of life. Since the Jews were God's holy, consecrated people, they were to keep themselves from any defiling influence. The Gentiles, however, were defiled with idol worship, which was associated with immorality. Therefore, the preservation of true worship and a good moral life required separation from subverting influences, and the law was a protecting fence for the Jewish people. Only the body of Jesus accomplished the miracle of bringing together such disparate groups. Only the body of Jesus. We might well see a reference to the Eucharist here. The law, which is considered to be a dividing force among human beings, has been removed by Christ. He has been our excess who took two separated Jew children, Jews and Gentiles, united them as brothers, and brought them into the intimacy of God's family so that they might become members of God's household. So the letter to the Ephesians illuminates and enriches our understanding of the gift of reconciliation, helping us to see that the gift of peace with God makes possible the the, the makes possible a profound understanding among disparate groups of human beings. What is more, the vision of Revelation, indeed the whole story of the Bible, leads us to look forward and hope for a creation restored to wholeness. Every facet of it is to be brought back to God, to the purpose for what God intended it. And within the glorious fulfillment and perfect whole wholeness, there is a place for us. Redemption is cosmic in its scope and will only be complete when all things are brought together in Christ. Until that time, we experience only partial reconciliation, but live in hope. It is within this framework of the vertical, horizontal, and cosmic reconciliation that we are to see Christian mission. However, my brothers and sisters, as Paul reminds us in that verse from 2 Corinthians that is the basis for our reflection during these days, reconciliation is a gift that can be lost. We should ask ourselves whether this possibility is not a consequence of new walls that are being erected in the church today. What is happening? I believe that a good deal of the acerbic dissonance among American Catholics is a product of the way the church is presently embedded in the society. Let me use an experience from another nation to illustrate what I mean. In 1993, while serving as, a, as an assistant to the Superior General of the Redemptress, I visited our province in Chile, in Latin America. Another assistant and I arrived in the capital, Santiago, a day after, or two after the election of the new provincial superior. The new leader had just been elected on the 35th ballot of the provincial chapter. <laughs> he had received practically no votes on the first 34. <laughs> One does not have to be a brain surgeon to recognize that we were visiting a seriously divided province a province that might make Mr. Obama and Mr. Romney look like bosom buddies. <laughs> a day or two after, after our arrival, I walked in the garden of the provincial residence with the newly chosen sacrificial lamb. <laughs> and Padre Raul tried to explain what lay behind the circumstances of his election. He said, Jose, in this country we suffered under a military dictatorship. 
beginning in 1973 and lasting until just a few years ago. We hated the government. We preached against it. Together with the people, we took to the streets to protest. Some of us even went to jail. We put our lives on the line to topple the dictatorship, but without us being aware of it. Their way of thinking penetrated us. And now we treat each other like militares. As a result, when a new junta assumes power in the province, it exiles to the hinterlands all the enemies of the state. Raul suggested to me a dark side of enculturation, a dynamic that induced my brothers to appropriate unwittingly the very values that they opposed with such passion. I believe that something similar happened among my confreres in Eastern Europe, where redemptress learned a great deal from their opposition to the Communist Party, and not all of it was good. If you know anything about the religious life today in South Asia, you know that the sort of fundamental equality that is so prized among us religious is in fact seriously undermined by a caste system which is over 4,000 years old. So my friends, I wonder if some of the enmity, the acrimony, the name calling, the labeling and intolerance that appears to increasingly characterize the American political discourse passes unchallenged into the heart of the American Catholic Church. Furthermore, there is evidence that the new information technology, far from providing a catalyst towards a richer conversation among different groups, in fact, whether in the, in the public square or in the church, exacerbates the ideological divide and aggravates alienation by allowing us to discover quickly which sites and blogs favor our point of view while isolating us from contrasting opinions. Another cultural trend that may be exerting a de deleterious effect within the church is the tendency to oversimplify what are really complicated questions in the hope of finding out who to blame. Some examples. The global economic crisis has been caused by higher taxes. The decline of religious vocations is due to the infidelity of religious themselves. Married priesthood would eliminate sexual abuse. What Pontius Pilate and the Pharisees were once were to Jesus of Nazareth, the Vatican and the hierarchy are to religious today. Such simplifying and blaming probably has been around since the tragedy of Eden, when Adam blamed Eve, who in turn accuses the snake. We're not sure who the snake accused afterwards. At the present moment, this behavior helps to contribute to the balkanization of American Catholics into right-wing, left-wing, center-wing groups who point fingers at each other in my opinion, finger pointing does great harm, especially to religious, because it makes us defensive. And defensiveness harms religious life in a fundamental manner. If our life is truly evangelical, that is, a life that takes its ultimate norm as its no ultimate norm, the following of Christ set forth in the Gospels, this life is at risk if we feel constantly compelled to defend ourselves, against other parties in the church, since such self-protection will make it less likely that we will humbly examine our, the distance between our own ideals and the present moment, which is the point of departure for a life of continuing conversion. After all, the Gospels begin with the words, repent, the kingdom of God is near. Recently, in his homily at the funeral of, Carlo, uh, of Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini, the, the present Archbishop of Milan, Cardinal Scola, noted that diversity is an absolute precondition for communion. If we're all the same, communion is impossible. Yet there is an unmistakable impression that new walls are being erected, and exponents of comp and competing ideologies seem to accept the cost of the construction 
that is, the creation of increasing marginalization within the people of God. This place is being dramatically created, even expanded through a process of what we might call boundary maintenance in both society and the church. The French social thinker Emile Durkheim proposed that law and crime function to mark the boundaries of acceptable and unacceptable behavior in any large-scale society. That is why they represent broad and social guidelines for people's behavior. As historians know, boundaries, be they cultural, ethnic, or geographic, can be revised. This is not necessarily a bad thing. I think that the Council of Jerusalem, which we read about in Acts 15, the Nicene Creed, and the doctrine of the Second Vatican Council all represent some sort of boundary maintenance, insofar as they are efforts to clarify the identity of a group by elucidating its essential norms. I believe we can agree that both society and the church are engaged in a process of boundary management today. In part, this movement has been provoked by postmodernity, understood as a set of cultural circumstances that signifies the obliteration of boundaries and the confusion of categories. Societies experience globalization and the mass migration of peoples. The church wrestles with relativism and an often, often vapid catechesis. As a result, new lines are drawn in the sands of the Sonoran Desert, while clear doctrinal statements and moral litmus tests seem to short circuit or devalue dialogue. Fresh or reinforced boundaries create new spaces in which the marginalized are consigned. In a clear contradiction of the norms and cultural practices of the Judaism of his time, Jesus healed the sick, expelled demons, and multiplied loaves and fishes in pagan territory, a place that could not be seen from the lofty heights of Jerusalem. But this space existed also within the traditional territory of the Jewish faith. Otherwise, how can we understand the consistent accusation that was leveled against Jesus, a charge that probably led to his death, that he shared table fellowship with those beyond the pale? As the Pharisees asked, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? It is easy for the church to overlook this action of, of Jesus. I was a member of the 2005 Synod of Bishops that was concerned with the Eucharist. The Synod lasted nearly a month, and as you might imagine, the number of speeches that were shared and the vast range of scripture that was reviewed. To my shame, to my shame, it was only afterwards that I realized that in all that debate, no reference was made to any verse of scripture that spoke of Jesus sharing table, ship, table fellowship with sinners. Before pointing the finger at the other members of the synod, I accused myself of having a scandalously bad memory. Now lest I be misunderstood, let me clearly state that boundaries are not intrinsically evil. A lack of personal boundaries or the willingness to respect the distinctiveness of another person can be indications, and probably are indications, of psychological path path pathology. God intends that the church have identifiable char characteristics, such as the four that we profess every Sunday, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. However, lest we be too quick to exclude others, Jesus insists that the world will recognize us as his disciples first and foremost by the love we have for each other. And he prays that we will be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Religious men and women who work in vocation ministry are not simply talent scouts, recruiters, or salespersons of spiritual snake oil. First and foremost, you are members of institutes of consecrated life, and as such, you are called to manifest the characteristic features of the life of Jesus, as well as the mystery and the mission of the church. 
While divine in its institution, the church necessarily is anchored in time and must recognize how the gospel is challenged in every era. In fact, one of the two great principles for the authentic renewal of religious life as mandated by the Second Vatican Council is our adaptation to the changed conditions of our time. I will argue that the present discourse within the American Catholic Church, insofar as it promotes division and marginalization among the faithful, is in fact a changed condition of our time, and as such merits the special intention of all religious in this country. If religious who serve in vocation ministry wish to make their own the privilege that Paul claimed for himself, that is, the privilege of being an ambassador for Christ, then your ministry ought to read the construction of new walls in the Catholic community in the light of the principal consequence of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is, reconciliation with God, a fact that makes possible reconciliation of separate human beings and final reconciliation of the whole cosmos with its creator. Thus, not only will you not tolerate the construction of dividing walls, you will do all in your power to dismantle any such works in progress. You do so because as ambassadors, you represent not only your particular religious family and the Catholic Church, but also God, who is appealing through you in Christ. Now, you recognize that that last Feverino begs a very important question. What's a vocation minister to do? In the light of recent events, I believe that the theme of this convocation, vocation ministers as ambassadors for Christ, a reconciling presence, is providential. It is not an easy subject. But your ministry has never been cushy. If once it was true that a vocation minister had to live with the unrealistic expectations inflicted upon her or him by other members of their institutes, even a sort of unspoken annual quota or headcount, today she must try to integrate new members into a community in which many of the members have a very different experience of church from theirs. How do we reconcile the reality of our religious congregations with the dreams of those who discern with us? Given the polarization in the church, how do we effectively reach out to the other in openness, charity, and love? Our community members look to, to us for hope. How do we reconcile the gospel-centered hope in a ministry that might challenge our own hope? Here's where we get to the third index card that reads, you're on your own, Linda. <laughs> but let me offer a few suggestions. I'm counting on you to add your own. First, propose religious life as a following of Jesus Christ. The first suggestion flows from an insight of Pope Benedict XVI. On a number of occasions, the Holy Father has insisted that Christianity is not a moral code or philosophy, but it is an encounter with a person. All of the church's life is intimately related to that encounter. In meeting Jesus Christ, we come to glimpse ever more clearly the Missio Dei, God's mission, which is essentially a mission of reconciliation. Through the Son, God has brought reconciliation to the world, overcoming sin, disobedience, and the alienation we have wrought. Christ reunites us with God through his saving death, which God confirms in the resurrection and the revelation of a transfigured life. The Holy Spirit empowers the church to participate in the ministry of the Son and the Spirit in reconciling the world. The church itself is in need of constant reconciliation but becomes the vehicle of God's saving grace in a broken and disheartened world. Seen in the light of Christ, the polarization within the church becomes, can become a felix culpa, a happy fault. Insofar as human sin can be forgiven, 
dividing walls can be dismantled and enemies can become sisters and brothers. Living in the memory of what Christ has gone through, suffering and death, yet not forgotten and indeed raised up by God. This memory is the source of our hope. Hope allows us to keep the vision of a reconciled world alive, not in some facile utopian fashion, but grounded in the memory of what God has in fact done in Jesus Christ. Paul captures this well in another passage from 2 Corinthians. But we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. A second suggestion, to avoid labeling. A problem for consecrated life in the United States and elsewhere today may be that we are slow to recognize the religious aspirations of young people. Now, I would hasten to say that the United States has less excuse to be ignorant of the aspirations of young people because you have very good materials that have been brought together by the National Religious Vocations Conference and the CARA study. Let me try to illustrate what I'm talking about with two examples admittedly taken from the experience in other countries. A few years ago, I was speaking with Timothy Radcliffe, then the Master General of the Dominicans. I love that title. It's like something out of Star Wars. <laughs> the Master General. And we were talking about the situation of the order in France. Timothy astounded me by saying that on that particular day, I think it was in 1999, the Dominicans had 45 or so professed students in that country. He added that the Toulouse province, the southern province in France, had an average age of 47, if my memory serves me right. Once I saw that Timothy wasn't joking, I had the impression that there weren't 45 men in formation in any, in all, religious institutes and dioceses in France. I asked him to explain the Dominicans' apparent success. He first reminded me that vocation is, always remains a mystery, a mystery of love, and resists being reduced to one or several causes. But he did suggest that there were two critical elements behind the orders flourishing in France. First, the order had made concrete decisions aimed at clarifying its identity in France. Secondly, as master of the order, and this I found very interesting, Timothy had to intervene between the young professed and the confreres of the so-called generation of 68, the 1968 generation, the grizzled veterans of the enthusiasm and upheaval of the 60s. Otherwise, the older confreres would eat the young confreres alive, <laughs> judging that their appreciation for habits, regular order, and common prayer were simply a reactionary fantasy that would result in the order reassuming the chains that had been justly discarded decades before. Later on, I found a similar logic in units of my own congregation. I remember taking part in a provincial chapter in Australia seven or eight years ago. The province had received one or two profession in the last 15 years. So I asked uh, the, the chapter what they were doing about vocation ministry. When I asked about candidates, a number of the capitulars agreed in quite dismissive terms that the only type of inquirers the province was then receiving were what they dismissed as right-wing kids. I suggested that they might call th those young people different and asked whether we were able to afford a new generation 
the same privilege that the baby boomers had so avidly claimed, the privilege of being distinct from our elders. We recognize that the culture of the community is important, and the vocation director alone cannot change it. It is vital that you work closely with the members of your governments to ensure that your communities are welcoming and that they avoid the trap of labeling. Now, the third suggestion I have is, is rather personal, and it comes from a firm belief I have, or I should say that I've learned, about my own vocation. When I first started out as a, a religious, I was working in the inner city of my hometown, Detroit, Michigan. And I quickly put out my shingle that I was there for the people and that I was going to work 24-7 as a sort of super priest. And I was often secretly pleased when people would say, Father Joe, Father Jose, you look really tired. I said, well, of course I am, because I'm spending my life for you. <laughs> Until one day, walking through the barrio, a mother whom I really liked came out with her kids to greet me. And she said, Father Jose, I really love you, but I would never want my son to be a redemptorist. I said, well, why not? And she said, because you're always tired. And that's when I began to play ice hockey again. <laughs> My point is that the principal motivation and the most effective resource for vocation ministry is the gratitude we feel for our own vocation. The gratitude is our attitude. And it's the attitude we try to reinforce and infect within our provinces and congregations. I know in my own province we had two, or in my own congregation we had two wonderful examples that have inspired me over the years. One was a fellow who was uh, still alive when I was a student. And he was a fellow that was not always very happy. And so it was telling how at meals he would often say, with a pious sigh, I wish I was a novice again. I wish I was a novice again. Until finally one day the superior asked him, why do you wish you were a novice again, Father Willie? He said, because then I'd quit. <laughs> my life in service of my brothers has convinced me that it's possible to leave the congregation and still live in one of our houses. <laughs> and that cannot help but have a deleterious effect on vocation ministry. Because young people will listen to the way we live, not simply what we say, or what we put in our pamphlets. I was also fortunate years ago to be visiting the southern Philippines at a crucial time in the life of the congregation there. Our vice province in the southern part of that country was about to become a province. And as a result, the leadership was going to pass from the founding redemptress, who were from the Irish province, to the Filipino confers. Now, quite understandably, the Filipino confers were a little worried about what was going to happen, because the Irish didn't always talk clearly. <laughs> it was hard to pin them down. <laughs> Imagine that. So I suggested that we have an assembly of the, the vice province, soon to become a province, in which we would ask the Irish to put their cards on the table, say how long they were going to be there. And so one by one, the Irish stated their intentions, that after the erection of the province, I, I'll be there for a year, you can count on me, or five years, or I think it's time that I go home. And the last to speak was the dean of the, the Irish community there, 84 years old, Peter Mulrooney. And Peter had been in Asia, in Southeast Asia for over 60 years, in Burma and then the Philippines. And when it came time for him to announce his intentions, he said, boys, put me down for 10 years and make it renewable. And the confers to this day say that those words are a source of enthusiasm in the province and also knowing that God took Peter at his word. He died 11 years later at the age of 95.
But the example of that self-giving love out of gratitude for his call continues to inspire those confers and I believe is responsible for a healthy number of young people who are entering the congregation. So if we give the impression that we're angry all the time, that it's a prophetic anger, I think young people will listen to us. They'll wonder why are they so angry? But they will be out of their minds to join us. That finally what will attract them is if we say we are grateful that God in his infinite love and compassion called us to our religious family. I never say in conclusion, because someone defined in conclu second wind as what happens when a redemptor says in conclusion. <laughs> Instead, I draw on some wisdom I, I received earlier today when someone assured me that this group really prays well together. And so I end this reflection with a final prayer that's also a blessing. And interestingly enough, comes just after Paul has talked about the gift of reconciliation. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he may grant you in accord with the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner self, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the holy ones what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to accomplish far more than all we ask or imagine, by the, that power at work in us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. Archbishop Tobin, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for uh, those rich and inspiring words and your, your positive and hope-filled message to us. I think we have a lot to think about and, and be grateful for at this time. And so in that light, we'd just like to take a few moments of silence to just let that message sink into our hearts and, and spirits and ask ourselves, what did we hear? And if you have any questions, so if, you'd, if you want to take a few moments in silence, if there's a particular question or a thought that you would like to share on those index cards, please feel free to do that. And in a few minutes, uh, Vince and I will come around and collect those cards from you. But just a moment of silence right now.
Okay, if there's anything you'd like to write on those cards, we invite you to do so at this time, and Vince and I will come around and, and collect them in a few minutes. Uh, if at the tables, you could just gather your cards in one person, hold them up as soon as you have them ready. In the meantime, we'd also like to offer a very special thank you to the Knights of Columbus, the Dallas Council, number 799, who sponsored uh, Archbishop Tobin's talk this morning. So we're really grateful to all those people who uh, help us.